This is a fairly normal looking camera. This is a fairly normal looking camera. But what the hell is this thing? This is the Canon L2. It's a camera that I first saw, I don't know how long ago, probably when I was a mini child. I saw it in a catalog or a movie or I don't know where. I saw it somewhere and I was just fascinated by it. I wanted to know more. It's just so weird looking at it. I needed to know more. But I had a hard time finding it. Over the years, I kept my eyes out to you know see where it cropped up. And I kept seeing the Canon XL1 and then the GL1 and thinking that those were the camera I had seen. But those weren't it. And I kept looking them up once in a while going, was that the camera I remember? But no, they were interesting. They were perhaps exciting, but they weren't anything special. Not in the way that this is. Okay, well, the XL1 is a really weird looking camera and I was always fascinated by it. But it wasn't this. So then a year or so ago, I was doing some searches on eBay for camcorders, and I came across this. Well, the Canon L1, actually, but they're damn near identical. The L1 was released in 91, this was released in 93. There's really no difference between them that I can find. They're, they're basically identical. So I'm just going to talk about them both as the L1. At the time, I started looking up information on them to find out what their capabilities were, what was special about them, what were they used for, that sort of thing. And I just couldn't find anything at the time. The Google searches turned up nothing. I couldn't find a manual. I, I couldn't find any uh, uh, user you know, stories about it, people who'd owned one. I couldn't even find them on eBay except for a couple. And they didn't have any information about what they did or whether they worked or anything. Finally, someone sent me some money to buy one off of eBay, and at the same time, a friend of mine was able to find some documentation on it, and I was able to learn a little bit about it, and then once it arrived, I was able to actually figure out what the thing was and, and what it was all about. I don't have all the questions answered. I have a number of them answered, and I have some speculation, and I've had this thing for a full calendar year at this point. In fact, I'm about a week over a calendar year. I want to show it to you so I can get rid of it. So let's go into what I've learned so far. So it is a camcorder. That much is true. It is, however, the strangest looking camcorder I've ever seen. Hands down, no contest. Even the XL1 is no competitor to how strange this thing looks. Now, it does have a runner-up, which is its sort of little brother, the A1. That came out in 1989, and that was sort of um, testing the waters, I feel. It looks like a very similar device. You can see how there's definitely some inspiration from one in the other. I think that Canon made the A1 initially to sort of test the waters for this radical new design, and the L1 was their serious entry into the market. But because it was their serious entry, they look completely different because Canon made one big change. They made it interchangeable lens. Now interchangeable lenses are not a feature on consumer camcorders, and let's talk about why. Here's a typical 1991-92 consumer camcorder. This is from Sony. It's a handy cam. It was a pretty popular line from them. And this one is, I would say, mid to high range consumer grade. Now this camera has a super zoom. I'll show you what that means. Super zoom means that this camera has an extremely wide zoom range on the lens. You see at the bottom there it says 5.4 to 64.8 millimeters. That is an absolutely enormous zoom range for a camera lens. If you know anything about photography, you will know that is a really big range. Well. Maybe not, because most photographers speak 35 millimeter terms, and this is in half inch sensor terms, but anyway, it's a huge range. That's 12 times magnification. You don't normally get that on a typical photographic lens. Take for instance this Canon 5D Mark I. This was nearly the top of Canon's range in like 2005, and I have on here a pretty mid-range lens that had been around for a few years. This is the 28 to 135. 28 to 135 is not anywhere near the largest zoom range that you see on a still camera. This is about four to five times magnification. So it's not an enormous range. It goes from mild wide angle to mild telephoto. Really, you could use this for portraits, and you could use it for landscapes, but you couldn't really go for anything extreme with this. You couldn't, you couldn't zoom in and see someone's pores with this. This one is several hundred dollars of high-end consumer grade lens. So it's about four to five times magnification, not nearly what this camera does. There's several reasons for that. One is that this camera has a much larger sensor than the camera that I showed you. That one has about a half inch sensor. This one has a 35 millimeter sensor. So about yay big versus yay big. That has a lot of impact on how you build a lens. It's harder to make a zoom lens that can do that wide a range on a sensor this big. If you wanted to have a zoom lens that big, it would be, well, it might actually be this big. Not joking. They make them. They're 
$2,500, $15,000, depending on what specs you want. A super zoom is critical on a camcorder because it allows you to go from this to this without having to swap lenses. You can just go there instantly. Why don't all cameras have super zooms? Zoom lenses push optical science to its limits. It's hard enough to make a fixed focal length lens. Making one that changes focal lengths requires math that's absolutely absurd in complexity, and it's an exercise in compromises. Below a certain price point, zoom lenses are just crap. They introduce tons of distortion, like the chromatic aberration visible in this picture from Wikipedia. It costs thousands of dollars to make a lens that doesn't have distortions like this. The reason you can get away with a super zoom on a camcorder is because they're typically very low resolution. Even the camcorder I'm using here, which is full HD 1920 by 1080 still doesn't clock in as many pixels as this thing has. Of course, this is from 2005, so it's not that many more pixels, but it's still more. And more importantly, in video, you're not pixel peeping. You're not staring at, at lines and freeze frames going, ah, is that, you know, I can't quite make that out. Everything's in motion. You're watching a soccer player run. You're watching a rally car drift around the track. You're watching someone jump off a cliff and break their neck in a tide pool they thought was a lot deeper. And the other thing is just that standard definition cameras like this one are so low resolution, they're so analog, they're so blurry. Any detail you lost in the lens is gonna be overwhelmed by the detail you lost going onto the videotape and then going back to the TV and being displayed again. The stakes just aren't that high. But with pro video, everything changes. Pro video cameras, even at standard definition resolution, are good enough and the broadcast quality is good enough especially if it gets put on DVD, for instance, that you could actually notice a quality difference in the lenses if you make a super zoom that's just too much. So if you put one of these super zooms into a professional grade camera, well, two things are gonna happen. First, you might not be able to get the shot because sometimes professional has to go even further than these super zooms can go. If this is the equivalent of a still camera 300 millimeter lens, a professional videographer might need to go to 500 millimeters, 800, 1200, and they might need to go all the way back to an ultra, ultra wide shot, as wide as 15 millimeters. They also need manual control. With this thing, you can zoom using these buttons here, but if you need to zoom in a hurry, you can only go as fast as it goes held all the way down. A professional lens has a ring you can just snap zoom with. It also has manual focus controls and manual iris controls, and these are things that are useless to consumers for the most part, but professionals absolutely need them. So Pro has two problems to solve. First, they need a lens that can go as far out as they need. And second, they need one that can go as wide as they need. And you can't necessarily put those together in the same lens because of the quality issues that crop up at that point. Especially when you're talking about ultra long range, the chances of being able to make a lens that's a thousand millimeters or longer, but can also go to ultra wide, it's just not gonna happen in the quality that you need for serious production work. While editing this, I discovered this was a factual error. They absolutely do make lenses that do this nowadays. For instance, this Canon goes from 7.5 millimeter ultra wide to 180 millimeter telephoto, which is a 24 times range. And this Fujinon goes from 8.4 millimeter to 900 millimeter, which is a hundred times range. That goes all the way from ultra, ultra wide to ultra telephoto in one big zoom. Also, they're unfathomably expensive. And the second one is absolutely gigantic. So while it's true that these do-all lenses exist, to get the quality you need for broadcast, you have to spend an unholy amount of money. And at some point, the lenses just become so large they aren't practical to carry around. So there's still value in smaller zoom ranges, so you can get a lens that's easier to carry around, less expensive to buy, and less upsetting to break. So if a pro can buy one camera and then pack two lenses, one that does medium to long telephoto and one that does wide to medium telephoto, that covers the whole range they need, that's good enough. So obviously professionals are gonna need interchangeable lenses, but you don't see them on consumer cameras because the chances of somebody needing that are just super, super slim. In the 80s and 90s, there were plenty of interchangeable lens cameras. My red JVC was an example of one. Of course, those were also $8,000, $15,000, and several thousand dollars more for the lenses. Now, Canon didn't play in this arena at all. They stuck to plastic consumer cameras, which they called like the Canavision. Their big entry to the pro video market was the XL1 in 1997. That really put them on the map. That was an interchangeable lens camcorder. Uh, as far as I know, it was a smash hit. Um, everybody that I've met who's used one seems to have fond memories about them. And I hear them crop up all over the place. I've, I've seen people just mention them spontaneously on forums and whatnot. Um, it was definitely a big deal. It was not in the same category as those big cameras, the big shoulder mount ENG cameras from Hitachi and, and JVC and Ikigami and whatnot. I get the impression, I don't really know, but I get the impression the XL1 was used for things like local TV, straight to DVD productions, documentaries, training videos, 
you know, schools, that sort of thing. But it was definitely a professional product and possibly one that nobody else was making. I think Canon may have been sort of alone in that market for a bit. The L1, as far as I can tell, was Canon's first attempt to do what would later succeed with the XL1. They seemed to throw a number of things at the wall here, and some of them stuck. Overall, I think most of it didn't. I have some notions about why, but I can't really prove them because the historical record is just totally blank. You'd think with how unique this is, that there'd be all sorts of magazine reviews and articles talking about it and, and just mentions all over the place, but there's just nothing. So either it was a failure or I'm just not looking in the right place, but I've just got to go off of speculation here. So let's start with hard facts. Let's look at the chassis. I try to dunk on obvious first attempts, but this thing is a total train wreck. Just looking at it is confusing. Let me show you the eBay pictures that first had me intrigued with this thing a year ago. They're just baffling. You could look at it from one angle and another, and even with the lens missing, you know something's missing, but you still can't make sense of what you're seeing. There's things that don't make sense. So why does it look so strange? There's two ways to grip this thing. The first is like a normal camcorder. You put your hand through this strap here, and now you can, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a normal camcorder. It's like any other camcorder you've ever seen, all right? You have a uh, trigger here that turns on and off recording. You've got your zoom controls there, and that's that. The other way to hold it is like this. You catching that? Back, back there? It's back there? Seen this? Now, it's pretty obvious what Canon's doing here. The idea is you hold it like a 35 millimeter camera. These are not ambidextrous, so it's upside. But look, you can see the family resemblance. It's very clearly modeled on the same design. And I think that's what's going on here. I think that with this camera, Canon wanted to enter the pro video market with a bang, but they had no name in pro video. What they did have was a name in 35 millimeter cameras, which this isn't, but it's damn close. If you look at an EOS from 1991, they really haven't changed the styling very much. It's gotten a little smoother and, and a little chunkier now, I would say, but the cameras are, are damn near the same. In fact, 35 millimeter styling hasn't really changed since the 30s, uh, except in the 80s when they added this hump here. It's both a finger grip and also a place to put batteries. Pretty much everybody adopted that in, in like the mid 80s. But other than that, 35 millimeter cameras have never changed. It's the way you use them that's solidified. And honestly, this part's even older. The way you use a camera is you grip it with one hand, with your finger on the shutter, and you put your other hand on the lens. That's always been how it's been. There are cameras from the teens that have this layout. One hand on the shutter and to hold the camera and the other one manipulating the focus, the zoom, and the iris if applicable. Now, because Canon had never made a professional camera before, they wanted to bring in those manual controls and the familiar photographic interface that they were so used to. So that's what they did with the L1. What they expect here is that you're gonna put one hand on the grip and then one hand on the lens. And then you can operate the focus here, operate the zoom here, but it's a 35 millimeter camera. You hold it like one, you use it like one. This is not to say that that's not what happened with serious broadcast cameras. All those big shoulder tanks like the JVC, it's the same thing. You've got one hand on one side of the camera and the other one manipulating the lens. Except that on those cameras, the strap is all the way up on the lens. So Canon, in a sense, has sort of made that design more compact here. In those photographs I showed you from eBay, the strangest thing about this camera is this wing that's sticking out here. That's what makes it look so odd. If it just stopped, you know, here, so it was just a, a cube with a, a weird slanted back. I don't think the thing would look so strange, but because it's got this big wing sticking out here, it seems to serve no purpose. It, it just, it's baffling to look at. And the reason for that is that what Canon's done here is they've flown in the face of all design from the entire broadcast camera world. And they've said that instead of putting the hand grip on the lens, like a good Christian, they've decided to put it on the camera body itself. And so you've got this weird, wings sticking out here. So obviously this was a misstep, except that it wasn't, and they maintained it onto the XL1. So that part seems to have worked out. What they lost was actually the rear grip, the 35 millimeter style grip. That one went away in 1997 when they released the XL1, and they never looked back. And good that they didn't, because it, it's awful. Holding this thing by this grip is just deeply unnatural. It, it works for 35 millimeter shooting, for still shooting, where you're, you're looking through the viewfinder and you're trying to get that perfect shot and then you press the button, but you, you get, it's like, it's like being a sniper where you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna dial it in and then hold your breath and then hit the button. But with video, you're, you're ever vigilant, right? You're, you're constantly working when you're using a video camera. 
The fact that the lens is in this position that it's in has other implications as well. Had they done this like a normal video camera in the broadcast field, they would have just had this body come all the way out to here and then started the lens here, or they would have had the body stop here completely. There's almost no room on this camera for buttons. Let me show you. Since the lens has nowhere to put buttons, they've been pushed onto the side of the camera, and then up onto this side, up onto that part, up onto that part, and then further, under the viewfinder, all the way up over the top of the camera, and then back down onto the other side on the hand grip. Every surface of this camera is just festooned with buttons because they needed room that that lens took away. And instead of making the chassis larger, they decided to just make the buttons closer together. The end result of this is I can't find anything on this camera. Whenever I'm looking around for a control, I find myself searching every area multiple times until I finally figure out where it is. I mean, hell, after all that, I forgot to mention, there's even some controls on the side of the viewfinder. I mean, they're everywhere. At a moment's notice when the heat is on, you're just not gonna remember that the audio attenuate button is there. And hell, look at how little room there is for accessories on that cold shoe. It's buried in this little canyon. This thing is just too cramped. And I think that's really what the problem with it is. I think for Canon, it was crucial that this resemble this as closely as possible. They wanted this thing to look like their award-winning SLRs did at the time. And the problem is there just isn't enough room for it. Even in the 35 millimeter film era, this camera was still using a medium that's much smaller. You would have the film reel here and the take-up spool over here, and that provides plenty of space for this camera to have the mirror box and the shutter, because that's really all there is in a 35 millimeter camera. This one, on the other hand, has to have all the room for the processing circuitry and for the videotape recorder mechanism, and there's really not that much room for it. I mean, if you look, an 8mm tape is pretty big. That takes up a good chunk of the back chassis here, and you've got to have all the support hardware around it. So this much of this is all videotape recorder mechanism. And the problem is, where does that leave you room to put all the processing circuitry? I've tried to open this thing up, but it is the Lament configuration. It is a billion little tiny wires, tiny screws, little plastic and metal things, so you just cannot open it up without destroying it. But if we just look at the layout, this is the sensor. What's behind it is going to be the mechanical support for the sensor and, and some of the electronics. And then you have a triangle here, which is where all of the support electronics must be. Everything that takes the signal from the sensor and turns into something that can be put on the tape has got to be right about in this, this triangle right here. That's a very small space. And then you've got to cram this eight millimeter tape recorder in the back here, taking up most of this. You know, it just, it stands to reason that this chassis is so lightweight since they had so little room to put any sort of reinforcement in here without making this thing twice the size. And it's obvious they wanted this to look like a 35 millimeter camera. And that's where they fucked up. And the final thing, by the way, it's flimsy. The fit and finish is just garbage and it's just plasticky and it's just, it's all hollow. It feels terrible in the hand. The controls are unpleasant to use from the 35 millimeter position. It's just really unpleasant. It's just, it doesn't feel good at all. Up here where your hand is kind of balanced with the lens, that's one thing, but holding it this way, just atrocious, useless, awful. Now, about that stability complaint, this here is the 15 times lens, which is about the largest that they made as far as I can tell. It's big, it's heavy, and it's made of metal, which is a very interesting point. That is unusual. Metal doesn't get involved in camcorders unless you're talking about those eight to $15,000 behemoths. Of course, the lenses there are all metal, but what's odd is that Canon's lenses weren't. If you were a consumer or even a low-end professional who bought a Canon lens in 1991, what you got was plastic. All plastic. Yep, that's plastic. Now, Canon did make metal lenses, but they were the L lenses. They were white, they had a red stripe on the end, and they cost, you know, $800 to $5,000 and up. There's a lot to make me think that this is a Canon L lens at its heart. It has the red stripe, it's got the white paint instead of black like all their consumer lenses, it's made of metal, and it's an f1.4, which is a really, really big deal. Let's not get into it. Suffice to say that that lens passes a lot of light. For comparison, this is a maximum f1.8, which is about the brightest you usually find in consumer cameras, and this one here is a maximum of f3.5. These lenses pass two times less light than that lens, and four times less light than that lens, if I remember my numbers correctly. And that means that 
This camera will not operate in light levels as low as that one, and this camera will have to use longer shutter speeds and thus get blurrier images potentially, among other things. In Canon's lens lineup, f1.4 usually meant L, it usually meant luxury, it usually meant really high price tag, but this was only $600. Sorry, no, I double checked, $500. There is no time in history when a high-end Canon zoom lens cost $500. That is highway robbery. And that makes me think that this was a loss leader. I think that Canon knew what they were up against trying to enter the video market. I think that they knew that they had not a snowball's chance in hell of being respected. And the best thing they could possibly do was try and get their weird half-baked design into people's hands by pricing it super, super low. I think this is a loss leader, and I think that's why it has a flimsy, plasticky chassis. I think they took their L lens design because they needed to bring the good optics, but everywhere else they cheaped out as much as they could. In one of the very rare reviews I found, a 1993 issue of Wired, the author has the exact same complaint that I do, that it's very hard to stabilize. Now, he is in a plane at the time, but... He does point out that his five-digit rig that he normally takes up there would not have had this problem. The reason is that rig was a standard, probably ENG camera, and they're heavy. They're 15, 20 pounds. Maybe less. Maybe they're like 8 pounds. That heaviness isn't just the joke from Snatch. Heavy is reliable. If it doesn't work, you can always hit him with it. It's also a specific important factor in how the camera works. Heavy doesn't just mean reliable, it means stable. A heavy camera is harder to move, so it moves less. This gives you the ability to handhold and shoulder mount it better because it's just going to wobble less because it's harder for little tiny vibrations to affect it. Case in point, I shot this footage from Judkins Park in Seattle with a 15 pound JVC camcorder, zooming and focusing by hand, and while you can tell it's not on a tripod, it's definitely serviceable video because I had it on my shoulder and it weighs a ton. In a pinch, you could put this on the local news and get away with it. You'll see later that the L2 and L1 just cannot make that claim. I don't have super hard details on what lenses were available, but I do have listings from 1992, 1994, and 1995 from the Adorama catalog, so I think I found everything. There was a 3x, an 8x, a 15x, a 250mm reflex, a 2x teleconverter. There's also a 100mm lens listed with image stabilization. I can't find any pictures of that, so I think maybe Canon never sold any, especially at this incredible price tag. Also, a fixed focal length lens on a camcorder is pretty buck wild and it sounds nearly useless even with image stabilization. The lens lineup is a little weird, but I think I understand the purpose of it all. The 8x seems kind of pointless compared to the 15 times because they pretty much overlap. So I'm guessing it's just that the eight times is a much lighter one. So you still have a pretty wide zoom range, but you don't have such bad stability issues. The 3X gets you a wider angle at the low end, so that's an obvious winner on its own. There was a 250 millimeter reflex lens. Now that's twice the magnification level of the 15X, but it's fixed focal length. So the use cases there are kind of limited. I guess you could use it for some good bird watching. But it's also just pretty cool to imagine a 30 times magnification on a camcorder, especially since it's a reflex lens, which makes it very small and light for how much magnification you're getting. The 2X teleconverter is also a cool accessory. As you saw in my JVC video, 2X tele is a pretty neat feature for on-the-spot video. You have it in pro video so you can get the shot even if it lowers the quality. This one isn't as quick on the draw because you have to attach it to the camera and then attach the lens to it, but it still beats being caught without anything long enough to get the shot. And consider that putting the 15X on this gets you a 340mm lens, which is pretty damn long, and putting that 250mm reflex on it gets you 500mm, which is good enough for anyone. Now the last thing, and I, I kind of wish I had this, but I just cannot get myself to shell out the money, is an EOS adapter. This is a fascinating product that Canon made sure was in all their print ads and their brochure, and it does exactly what it sounds like, which is it lets you mount lenses from Canon's established EOS line on this camera. So you can take this lens and put it on this camera. Now, that sounds straightforward, it sounds very cool, but there are caveats. I think it's highly debatable in itself that Canon had very many still photographers who had a stable of lenses just, you know, taking up space that they were raring to go to put on a video camera. I, I don't think very many people broke into that market, but I don't think Canon was really trying to attack that. I think their actual attack was, we made lenses, Let's at least give people some sort of gimmick to make this camera interesting with the lenses that are already on the market so we don't have to make new ones. And the gimmick comes from the second caveat, which is also kind of a neat positive thing, a feature, not a bug, which is that when you put this lens on this camera, it does not have the same magnification. 
This is a mirrorless camera. They're all the rage these days. They've not quite replaced a digital SLR, but they've made big inroads towards it. Now, if I open the shutter on this one, you can see that the sensor here is much bigger than the other. It's, it's kind of hard to make out because everything's so dark, but it's about, uh, I think, a third to two thirds larger than the one in this camera. So because this camera has a larger sensor than this camera, the lens has to be larger than this one. You can see it's quite a bit larger. What's strange about this is that this camera has an even larger lens. It's absolutely gigantic compared to the others, but the sensor in here is minuscule. It's, it's only, I think, a half of an inch across. It's absolutely just miniature. This lens is for a 35 millimeter frame. This is for a half inch frame. That means that this one makes a circle, a focused image that's about, about yay big, maybe a little bit bigger, but this one is a focused image that's only yay big. Now, if both of these have the same field of view on their appropriate camera, then what happens if you mount this one on that one? Well, it means that out of this much circle, you're only taking that much of it. Now, if this lens was a telephoto on here, meaning that it zooms way in and has a very narrow field of view, if you put it on here, it's going to take only the tiny section from the middle, which means it's going to blow that section up to the full image, which means you now have an even longer lens. In fact, five times longer. So if you were to take a relatively cheap, like several hundred dollar, 300 millimeter lens from this system and then mount it on here, it would become an ostentatious 1500 millimeters. And in fact, that is what Canon shows in the brochure here is getting a 3500 millimeter lens on your video camera. Now, Canon does point out that the center of the image cast by a lens is the sharpest part of it. So in theory, that little tiny chunk of it that you're getting is going to be the best looking part of it. So you're not just getting an obnoxiously long lens. You're also getting one with really, really high quality. I don't know who this is for that needs standard definition video with absolutely obscene telephoto capability. But if you're that person, then this is fantastic. And again, you're going to have massive problems with shake unless you have this thing on a pile of sandbags. With all those complaints, it is true that if you bought this camera body with this lens, which seems to be the only thing anybody ever bought, per the eBay listings where I can only ever find this lens, this was a pretty good camera. This is pretty much a more pro version of this. It's a super zoom. It goes from super wide to super long. You can carry it with you all the time, and you're going to be able to handle most situations with just this one lens. It is built like a brick shit house. It does have manual controls on it. It's a fantastic camera. The question is just who it was for. Serious pros wouldn't want something this lightweight and shaky. Vacationers wouldn't be able to afford it. I feel like it would just be schools that bought it and like a few tinkerers and maybe like people from the Audubon Society. I guess the Jackal had a use for it. Mother fucker. Look at the friggin' lens. 2,000 mile zoom lens. I think the interchangeable lens feature is very interesting and it would go on to be very successful on their later cameras, but the rest of this device is just not there yet. And I think that's why nobody seems to remember it. Maybe I'm wrong. Canon did follow up the L1 with the L2 two years later, so there must have been some demand. And they claim it was on their history site, but you know, of course they do. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was tremendously popular. If you've had experience with this, if you remember it, or if you ever owned one, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know that I'm wrong and that this thing was actually a smash hit and had some really cool features. Let me, let me know. One remaining thing that makes me think this wasn't so popular is that all of them are broken. Everyone I can find on every site is either as is unknown condition or does not work. This one, in fact, does not work. The first one I bought was stone dead, wouldn't even power on, not even with a power supply attached to the battery clips. So that one I just ended up throwing away. I couldn't. This one powers on, uh, it emits video out of the side, but it has no viewfinder and uh, it won't record anything. So it's half dead as well. However, mine does work well enough to demo, so I'll show you what I've got. I have some footage from earlier that I recorded. I don't have any field footage, unfortunately, because I really have not found a way to get this thing to work in the field. Um, maybe I'll do that before I throw it away, but that is what's gonna happen. I'm gonna throw it away, thank God. I'm so happy to get rid of this. I'm so happy. But let's look at the test footage first. Battery goes here in the hand grip, so at least that makes sense. Because this is high eight, that means it's in sort of the SVHS class, so it does have S video. That's definitely a plus. And there's the image. 
So here's the S video image, and I'll just show you that if we try and handhold this thing, even with my elbow braced on the table here, the shake is, is just obscene. Uh, it, it's just completely uncontrollable. With this enormous lens on here, you really would have to put it on a tripod for it to be the least bit usable. Now, this might be better with the lighter weight lenses, the smaller ones. It's just hard to imagine spending the money on those when you, when you had this option. So you'll notice that even at its widest angle, where handshake doesn't make that big of a deal usually, this thing is still uncontrollably wobbly when holding it from the back grip. If we switch to the front grip here, it gets a bit better. It's still kind of, kind of shitty though. The image is about standard for your typical 1993 camcorder. I'm not sure if I'm capturing it the best here. Um, it does the, uh, the auto exposure thing like all these do. Um, it has power zoom, which you can do it different speeds, but they don't get very fast. Uh, and the autofocus is a little touchy. See, it does take quite a while to dial in. The image is good, but again, a typical 1993 camcorder has a pretty good image at standard definition. I'll go ahead and point out the window here. It renders the great outdoors fairly reasonably. The great outdoors being a dumpster and a pile of siding outside my house. The color isn't anything particularly special, but you will notice that this zoom really is something special. That is a very long distance. Let me show it to you again. From here to here. But the autofocus really struggles to keep up. And that's kind of what I would expect from a strange hybrid like this. Now I'll show you the value of the manual controls on the lens. I've turned off autofocus and now I can snap focus pretty reliably using the ring on the front of the lens here. It's, it's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. Okay, and the battery has died, so I'm going to have to charge it before I can show you anything else. So I put this on a monopod to control the shake some, and you know, the pictures it takes are, they're pretty nice looking. Um, the fact you can manually focus means you're, I'm probably getting a better image than I would necessarily get if I was using a camera with only autofocus or, or one with only digital focus. Um, you know, it looks as good as any of the pro cameras I have. It's just, I think that video became kind of low-hanging fruit in the 90s. Like, I just don't think it was hard to get an image that looks this good. So, it's possible the actual recorded image on the tape looked better than competing cameras, but without the ability to actually do that, I, I can't really tell you. I can't show you how a lot of the controls on here work because I, the viewfinder is broken and I can't record. So I can only show you a couple and the primary one I'm interested in is the digital effects. Now digital effects like wipe and mosaic and invert colors and whatnot were all the rage on consumer camcorders in this era um, and they got used a ton in like hip hop videos. But this one I think has a couple that I'm not sure how common they were and they're pretty neat. So for instance, I'll press this and then you have to press digital effect on and off to trigger them. It's kind of weird. So the first one here is a digital zoom and it makes everything blurry right away, which isn't surprising because there just aren't very many pixels on the sensor to recover an image from. So that one's not hot shit. The next one is this slow shutter effect. The sort of thing that would have been all the rage in, like I said, hip hop music videos, that sort of thing. The third one is a fade effect. And what's neat about this is that if you press and hold the digital effect on, it holds the image, I guess, in like a digital frame buffer, which I think would have been rare at the time. I, I might be wrong, but I, that's a pretty advanced piece of electronics for the era. So I think this one's kind of special. So it holds that until you let go, at which point it fades. So that allows you to do these sort of like television sitcom transitions where you can like freeze on an image, hold it, and then do a voiceover and then fade out to your next image. So that's a pretty cool feature. The next one is a wipe that works the same way. So you press and hold the button, it stores the image for as long as you like, and then when you let go, it transitions to the current image. Also pretty neat. The next one just saves the current image. If you hold it down, it sort of does the uh, slow shutter effect, but in sort of a jittery way, and then when you let go, it keeps it saved. There is a solarize effect because that was all the rage back then, and again, if you hold that down, you can get this sort of jittery slow shutter with solarize effect. And that's it, that's all the digital effects we have. There's also a fade, which fades to white for some reason. It's probably a menu option, but since I can't see the viewfinder, I can't change it. 
And then when you're shooting in auto mode, there is a exposure control that lets you just tell the camera to do a combination of changing the iris and adjusting amplification of the sensor. And well, I can't show you that because the battery just died again. That was a brand new battery, by the way. <laughs> Oof. Oh, that's got an odor to it. God, that stinks. I don't know what that smell is, but that battery fucking reeks. For comparison, I'm going to put this 1993 consumer palm quarter on a monopod and shoot pretty much the same image. See, I'd say this looks about the same, and using the manual focus control, I'm able to focus pretty easily through the field here. It's not, it's not a huge difference. It's, it's, it's a little, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's a little better dynamic range, like maybe the dark parts are a little brighter over on the other camera, but that, you know, that could be a setting for all I know. There's also something to be said for, the autofocus highlights on this one look like shit, but the blurry parts going through the other lens look a lot better. So, you know, I guess quality of optics definitely matters. But by and large, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not night and day. Consumer camcorders at this time were pretty good. So that's all I've got. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.